I'm down at the end of the Connemara Peninsula, about three miles south of a little town called Clifton. And I have come here because this desolate wasteland was the scene of a very exciting experiment. This building is all that remains of the radio station established by Marconi, the first commercial transatlantic radio station ever made in the world. And here there were 120 people employed, busy sending messages from Britain all the way across to America. But the technology that was used to do it was remarkable. I don't know if you've ever played around with a battery near a radio set. If you try it now, take an ordinary battery and run a wire from the bottom to the top and just brush the top lightly. And you should hear a crackling in the radio station as little sparks are generated as you rub the wire across the top of the battery. That basically is what Marconi was doing. Only instead of a battery, he was using an enormous setup. So big that he had to have his own generator. Let's go over and look at that. But as we go, we notice something else. Down here, half buried in the ground, is this enormous chain, which was once part of the apparatus for holding up the aerials of Marconi's radio station. The site here was so large and so much heavy equipment needed to be transported back and forth that Marconi actually built his own little railway, a narrow gauge railway, just two feet wide, that carried goods from the nearest railhead and brought them here to the site and carried them around the site. To send a spark powerful enough to reach all the way across the Atlantic, Marconi needed lots and lots of power. And for that, he, there were no mains electricity supplies available. He couldn't put in a plug somewhere. So he had to build his own generating station. There you can see part of one of the generators. And to keep the generator supplied with water, he had a lake, a loch, behind me. And the generator was powered with the traditional Irish fuel of peat. And just to give you an idea of the size of the generators, not only that, but look over here where you have the mounting blocks for the generators. There's one over here, another one over there. The generator stood in between these, a huge, massive thing powered by steam, the heat generated by peat, the water drawn from the lake, providing power to send telegrams across the Atlantic. But as well as having the power produced by the generators, Marconi needed to have that power in a form that was instantly accessible so that when the operator pressed that key, there would be an instant spark. And to do that, he needed to store the power, not in batteries, they were too slow to react, but in capacitors. Now, a capacitor is really very simple. It's two plates of, of conducting material, metal, close together. And because they're close together but not actually touching, a charge builds up between them. And when you short it out, that charge instantly is available. The thing about capacitors is that there are two ways of increasing the charge that the capacitor will hold. The first is to make the sheets of metal bigger. The second is to bring the sheets of metal closer together. Now, if you look at a modern capacitor, you'll find that something the size of a pea, when you open it up, it contains maybe a foot of silver foil, two sheets of silver foil separated by a very thin bit of paper. And the paper serves to insulate the two pieces of foil from each other. They wound around very tightly together and they hold a surprising amount of power. But Marconi didn't know about that. His sheets of metal were separated by air. 
So the only way he could increase the charge was by increasing the size of the plates of metal. And he ended up with some 40 sheets of metal, about the size of the side of a house, separated by six inches or so. One hanging down, carrying a positive charge, one standing up, holding a negative charge. And these were leaved together like the fingers of your hand, but of course not actually touching. And with that power, he was able to send the spark, the message, all the way across to America. Of course, any fool can generate a spark. All you've got to do is bring two electric wires close together and you have a spark. Don't try that at home, children. Marconi's genius lay in creating the receiver that was sensitive, sensitive enough and tuned to the right wavelength, so a spark generates a wide range of frequencies, to be able to pick up the spark at a distance. And in order to transmit those radio waves across the Atlantic, Marconi built here an aerial. On this spot where I'm standing, you had a pylon 180 feet high. It was held in position by ropes, steel ropes, anchored to the concrete block you can see over there in front of me. And then there's another concrete block over here. And those concrete blocks held the rope, the mast upright, despite the wind, the gales, the near hurricanes that blew on this exposed part of the Irish mainland. And then between these posts, these 180 foot posts, there was another one over there, ran an aerial, several aerial wires, nearly three quarters of a mile long. <laughs> Today, of course, we know that you don't need so much equipment. We have more sophisticated methods. We tune to the exact frequencies. But Marconi was a pioneer, and he was at the cutting edge of technology. And the result was that some of his equipment was what we would consider crude. But by the standards of the age, it was an amazing feat of technology. This radio station was set up in 1895, that means 115 years ago. And over the years that it was in operation, there were many exciting moments. One day, for example, the workers at the radio station heard the sound of a motor, but it wasn't coming from inland, from the town of Clifton. It was coming from up in the air. And then, no doubt, there was a thud followed by a good deal of bad language. It was Alcock and Brown on their pioneer flight across the Atlantic. The monument that you can see over there is to Alcock and Brown's achievement in landing here after their endurance flight across the Atlantic. Unfortunately, on the other side of the monument, there is a wide expanse of flat ground that Alcock and Brown must have thought was just ideal for their landing. It looked like an aerodrome. It was, in fact, a peat bog. And as soon as their plane landed on it, the wheels sank down into the peat and the, came to an abrupt halt and the plane tipped forward on its nose and was thoroughly wrecked. It was a somewhat inglorious end to a glorious achievement. Marconi's radio station continued in operation until the 1920s. And at that time, the Irish were engaging in a war with Britain to try and gain their independence. And the methods that they used were, not to put too fine a point on it, terrorism. And another word for terrorist is vandal. Because these Irish terrorists ran around blowing things up. And for some reason they decided that the ideal method of asserting Irish independence was to destroy the Marconi radio station here at Clifton. And so the station came to an inglorious end. Mind you, by then it was already old hat and new technologies were emerging that were taking the place of the cumbersome equipment constructed here by Marconi. But nothing can detract from its place in history as the first site of a transatlantic radio station. <laughs>